In this video, we're following up on a conversation we recently started here on the channel about the Alexa 35's newest firmware and specifically a feature within this new firmware that allows us for the very first time to use our own custom shooting LUT in camera the same way that we would with any other cinema camera. This video led to a bunch of really good conversations in the comments and those conversations led me to want to kind of clarify and simplify a few things for all of our sake so that we can feel like we are exerting full creative control over our image making process when we are working with this camera. So a couple things that I want to dive into today, but really where I want to start is by talking about dynamic range. So I think that's sort of like the number one tagline that most of us associate with the Alexa 35 versus its predecessor is we have more dynamic range with the Alexa 35. Most of us are kind of aware of that talking point, right? But I want to talk about what that means for a second. And to make this a visual conversation, let's take a look here in Resolve and take a look at these two images I have here that are depicting the same scene. They photograph the same subjects and test charts, etc. One was shot on an Alexa Mini, the prior generation of Alexa. One was shot on an Alexa 35. And right now I am transforming each out into display space using the respective recommended transforms provided by the manufacturer for the camera in question. Okay, so I've got the Log C3 to 709 LUT being applied to the Alexa Mini image, and I have the Log C4 to 709 LUT being applied to the Alexa 35 image. And why am I doing this? Why am I showing these two right now? I want to emphasize something. The added dynamic range of the Alexa 35 has benefits, and we're going to talk about what those benefits are in a moment, but one of the benefits that it does not have, one of the changes that it does not imply, is that we're going to somehow get a different rendering of our image. We happen to be looking at this image in SDR, but the same even holds true for HDR. The rendering of the image itself is not going to change, and you can see that proven out right here between these two images. Is my exposure or my brightness or my contrast or my highlight retention different between these two image preparations? Not really. We could go in and probably identify some forensic differences, but it's not like one is a stop brighter or something like that. So that's the first thing I want to emphasize is that increased dynamic range in camera has benefit, but it does not mean that we are getting a brighter or a different distribution of dynamic range on the display side. And the reason for this is quite simple. It's because we may have increased dynamic range on the capture side, but our display didn't get that same upgrade, did it? Our display still has the finite dynamic range that it has always had. And again, I want to emphasize this is true of SDR as well as HDR. These are both display formats that have finite dynamic range, less dynamic range than that of our camera. By the way, that's good news because if we had a display with more dynamic range than our camera, we would have to figure out what to do to fill out that dynamic range when we are putting the image on the display, right? So that's kind of point number one. We are always going to be starting with more dynamic range, at least ideally, we're going to be starting with more dynamic range and we are going to be compressing down to less dynamic range. And this leads me to uh, a point that I want to emphasize based on some of the conversations that we had around uh, this prior video. If we turn this off for a moment on this uh, log C4 image, and we go over here to the timeline level where we were working before in our prior video, and I turn on my two nodes here and turn on my effects. So you can see I'm using a CST to map into airy wide gamut three log C3 from airy wide gamut four log C4, right? And there was a bit of concern and question about whether this is an appropriate thing to do with log C4 material. And there was even the suggestion that we're essentially nuking the dynamic range or compromising the integrity of the image by doing so. And while that's true, there's really more nuance to this that needs to be explored if we're going to really understand what we're talking about when we say there are implications to making this transform. Let's again make it visual and make it simple. I'm going to turn off our output transform. I'm going to use my favorite friend, the grayscale ramp, to allow us to visualize what's happening to our image. Let's go to our waveform here and take a look at what this transform is doing compared to where we started. So I want to even simplify even further by turning my tone mapping off. And we can see that the observation is correct. If we look at this waveform, we toggle this off and on, what does this mean? This means that by the time we have moved into wide gamut 3 log C3, there are values that were in bounds in log C4 that we are throwing out of bounds in log C3. So this proves out the observation that we are losing or we are throwing away dynamic range when we go from log C4 to log C3. 
However, I want to point out what we actually did in our prior video, which is to set our tone mapping to luminance mapping. Now watch the waveform as I make this change. Now we've got a shoulder. Now it's being smoothly rolled in, smoothly compressed, right? And you might still say, well, Cullen, that's nice that you're smoothly compressing those out of range values, but that's not the same as preserving the scene linear values as they were originally captured in log C4. And again, that would be a correct observation. We are fitting or we are compressing in a more graceful way than simply by letting this clip out, but we are still altering the relationship between the different uh, exposures or intensities of captured image when we move into log C3. But here's the part that I really want to drive home and point out now. This is, again, a log C3 to 709 LUT that we are using here. This is a preferential LUT that's making a creative transform, as well as fitting me into the dynamic range of my display. Any LUT that doesn't do that, any display LUT that doesn't do that, isn't a very good display LUT, right? So let's take a look at our waveform once we apply this change. Okay, so we've got this very strong slope being introduced here and we've still got this shoulder being introduced up here. Now, let's take a look at an alternative scenario here. Let's go ahead and grab a still of this, and I'm gonna uh, turn these pieces off, like so, and I wanna now look at the manufacturer recommended path for getting from log C4 out to Rec 709, so that we are effectively completely sidestepping the custom path out to Rec 709 that we were just taking a moment ago. Let's apply this. Now, I'm not going to suggest to you that these things are the same. If they were the same, then our prior video wouldn't have been necessary at all because this rendering would be fine to use. The whole point of using a custom LUT is that the rendering is different. But take a look at the fundamental character of these two curves here. The shoulder shape is changing, but ultimately because we are compressing dynamic range to fit our limited display dynamic range anyway, the fact that some pre-compression is happening in this scenario is not nearly as significant as we might think. I think the intuition here would be, oh, you're losing or you're altering the relationship of uh, the pixels and the brighter end of the captured image, and you're changing it in some way that you wouldn't need to if you stayed in log C4, but that's not the reality. The reality is we are always going to be mapping out to an even more limited dynamic range, a severely limited dynamic range. Again, SDR, that, this is gonna be true also with HDR because HDR has more dynamic range, but still far less than any cinema camera, certainly the Alexa 35. So one way or the other, we have to roll in our highlights. They are going to be rolled in. And the last thing that I want to emphasize here is that it's not wrong to say, I don't want this highlight compression, even though it's not nearly as simple as saying it's compromising the image in some uh, you know fundamentally flawed way. That's definitely not true. But even if you were to say, I just don't like it, I just don't want to compress my dynamic range or pre-compress my dynamic range, that's actually totally creatively valid if you're saying that from a basis of not liking what you're seeing on the screen. Okay, so that's the last thing I want to drive home here is that there is dynamic range in camera. More dynamic range is better than less dynamic range, not because of what we get on the image uh, in the final rendering, but because of the flexibility that it affords us in shooting and during grading. And once we are mapping out to our display state, this is the last thing that I really want to drive home. There is no single correct path to getting out to that display state. There are only better or worse paths to getting out to that display state. The better path is one that you visually like. The worse path is one that you do not visually like. But to prescribe a single path out to a display is not a recipe for success or for a uh, wide variety of interesting looking images in creative motion imaging. So that's the, kind of the last thing I want to drive home here is that while I respect and really uh, like the fact that Aerie have attempted to standardize the path to display with a really good robust display transform, I think their reveal color science happens to be really, really good. Saying that that's the only valid path to get out to a display simply isn't reasonable and is simply too confining from a creative standpoint. And that has to be part of the reason why they have released this new ALF 4C format that we covered in this prior video, because ARI recognizes there are many paths out to display. None are more uh, correct or incorrect than the other. It's all about creative intent. It's all about image authorship. And we should be putting that control in the hands of the people who are authoring the image. So that's the last thing I want to point out is that this is not about one idea being right or one path being right or one path being wrong.
It's about understanding all of the pieces, how they influence the final image, and making selections and choices all the way along your imaging pipeline that best support your creative intent.